This is the To Health With That, Naturally Healthy in No Time podcast for big health topics taken in small bites. I'm your host, naturopathic doctor Amy Nuzel, and this is season one, all about the MTHFR mutation. This week, we're going to do the corollary to last week, which is to talk about A1298C mutations. Again, in the current state of medical research, studies don't often differentiate between C677T and A1298C, so a lot of the research applies to both, lumping MTHFR polymorphisms into one category and quote-unquote wild-type genes, the research term for normal, into another. Still, we're starting to get a few more specific pieces of information. So first, let's start with technical details, which is nomenclature. What does it actually mean, A1298C? 1298 is the marker for this particular MTHFR gene. The official genetics labeling of this gene is RS1801131. The A and C stand for the nucleotide bases that you actually have. A equals adenine, and C equals cytosine. Essentially, A1298C could be read, at location 1298 of this gene, there is typically an adenine, that's the A, but actually a cytosine, that's the C. The wild type form of this gene is A1298A, right? We're expecting an A, and we've got one. You have two possible copies of each gene, not just this one, one from each parent. Two wild-type copies is typical genetics, right? That's A1298A all around. One wild-type and one altered copy is a heterozygous mutation, A1298C. So we're expecting A, we have C. Two bad copies is called a homozygous mutation. It's sometimes written as A1298C, homozygous, and sometimes as A1298C, C, meaning there's a C in both copies. Occasionally, I see it written as C1298C, but that's really sloppy and confusing, um, and it isn't commonly used. The A1298C polymorphism results in an amino acid substitution in the final protein of the NTHFR enzyme. So enzymes are made of protein, and the building blocks of protein are amino acids. It's called a GLU429 to ALA substitution, E429A. So that means that in the the enzyme that's manufactured by this gene, there's supposed to be a glutamine at location 429, but instead we see an alanine. And remember, this is location 429 of the enzyme, where the 1298 was the location on the gene. It's very confusing, I think, that the gene and the enzyme have the same name, but, you know, that's medicine for you. The substitution that we see, this mutation, happens in the, en- in the part of the enzyme that's presumed to be the regulatory domain. So, <laughs> what does all that mean? Well, actually, what it means is homozygous mutations, which is two C copies, two bad copies, have about 55% of the expected activity of the enzyme, which means about 45% compromise. AC folks, or heterozygous, have about 75% of the expected activity, meaning 25% compromise. Now, you will notice that all of these individuals have enzyme activity. In nobody is this enzyme entirely not working, right? It's working. It's just maybe a little slow. So a lot of people say, you know, one mutation's worse than another or whatever, which is true, right? The levels of compromise are different. But the biggest difference that we know of between C677T and A1298C is really just the level of compromise. So this particular polymorphism is associated with a little bit of a lesser compromise, so less specific research has been done on A1298C. It seems like most of the research shows a direct link between level of compromise regardless of cause, and outcome. So that means outside of the degree to which it slows down the enzyme, there isn't really any difference between C677T and A1298C that we know of. Of course, future research might reveal something compelling, but at this time, the degree of compromise in the enzyme activity is the strongest determinant of how much you are affected. And that also has to be combined with your 
folate status, right? You're resting folate status from your dietary sources and whatever. So having good folate st- status compensates quite a bit for bad enzyme activity. This is not what the internets say, right? I know. I've seen every kind of article claiming that A1298C mutations have more tendency towards neurotransmitter imbalance, and C677T mutations are more likely to lead to high homocysteine. But the thing is, clinically, I have never seen that bear out, right? I have seen equal tendency towards both in both groups, just depending on that person's lifestyle, their folate status, and then their own particular level of mutation, right? So if they have a homozygous mutation, it's going to, they might be a little bit more compromised than if they have a heterozygous. As far as all the research I have seen, that also doesn't bear out. (laughs) So where this idea came from, I'm not entirely sure, but my suspicion is that somebody on the internets had a theory, and then the rest of the internets echoed that theory back to them as though it were fact. If you're incredibly curious, I have a chart with different the percentage of enzyme activity in three different studies uh, up in the show notes, uh, and you'll notice that there's actually a range of enzyme activity. So, say you look at compound heterozygous, the range between the three studies, one says 36% enzyme activity, and the other one says 60% enzyme activity. That is a huge range. So, Obviously, the research has a long way to go, right? We are not pinpointing this yet. So it's really fascinating that we speak with such conviction about things like level of compromise, when really there's very few studies, and those studies don't actually agree with each other. The three that were used for the ranges that I just referenced um, are actually linked in the show notes as well, just in case you're curious, because it's actually... I mean, it's sort of like a slow motion train wreck <laughs> when you when you really start looking at it. To clarify, there probably are differences between C677T and A1298C. We just don't understand them yet. Because we are in kind of an early phase of the research, the bulk of studies look at wild type versus polymorphisms, and then sometimes pull out smaller data like homozygous versus heterozygous and detail things like that. Once we've built up a more complete body of research, then they can start to explore smaller questions. I strongly suspect that we will find differences in the challenges faced by different groups. I also suspect that they won't be nearly so cut and dry as this group has homocysteine challenges where the other group has a hard time making neurotransmitters. My suspicion is more along the lines of differences in the way um, different genetic patterns respond to therapeutic interventions and treatments. On an interesting aside, The research being done on athletic performance shows that A1298C mutations have an advantage at the highest level of athletes in activity that combines both speed and strength, but C677T does not. Why is anybody's guess? Because as far as we know, none of this has anything to do with muscle fibers, but obviously it does, so (laughs) go figure. Clinically, I find that overmethylation versus undermethylation that distinction is far more useful than the particular mutation that you happen to be, you know, carrying. The basic state differences actually tell us likely responses to supplements, where the particular mutation does no such thing. So clinically, it's far more relevant to actually understand your basic state than it is to really, you know, dig deep into your particular genes, unless, and I, and I think this is a, a valid caveat, If you hit a big roadblock in terms of treatment, and we just can't figure out what's going on or how to get you over the next hurdle or whatever, then sometimes digging into the genetics helps because there are other mutations that are happening in addition to MTHFR. Having said that, I really don't think genetic testing is necessary for all of the people who suspect that they have an MTHFR issue. At the end of the day, the symptoms that you experience are far more telling than the actual polymorphisms. So thanks for listening this week, guys, and I hope everybody has such a happy holiday season and gets to connect with their family in some way, whether that's, you know, over the internets or in person, and uh, stays healthy and happy, and I will rejoin you in the new year. Thank you. Bye-bye.